Greetings and salutations everyone, my name is Andrew Kirkhoff and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm going to be talking about my updated top 45 running back rankings for the 2024 fantasy football season. Now going into this upcoming weekend, I know many of you will be drafting your teams. So I thought to myself, I might as well put out my most updated running back rankings so that you guys can make the most informed decisions in your upcoming drafts. I'll talk about each of these 45 running backs on an individual basis, giving you guys my thought process and opinions. Additionally, statistics in order to justify their overall rankings. So with 45 running backs to talk about, let's begin with our number one, Christian McCaffrey of the San Francisco 49ers. Of course, this is a player that has been one of the most consistent over the course of the last two seasons as a San Francisco 49er. In those games, including the NFL playoffs, he's been averaging 21.97 fantasy points per game, primarily because he's been given far more opportunity than we could have ever expected 21.19 touches per game over the course of the last two seasons within a san francisco 49ers uniform now throughout those last two years he's played 39 games within this offense of course including the playoffs he has been healthy throughout this entire span of time and even though he is dealing with a calf injury going into the 2024 season i 100 believe he is going to be at a full go on monday night football against the new york jets and he's going to continue his reign as the number one running back in fantasy football he's the lead running back of the offense that in 2023 led the national football league in offensive touchdowns scored and going into 2024 i don't see the san francisco 49ers offense slowing down in any way christian mccaffrey continues to maintain the number one standing at the running back position our number two is Brees hall of the new york jets when we compare guys like Brees hall and the rest of the field there is a huge drop off i really do think that Brees hall by far and away is the next best running back and i would take him over Bijan robinson 100% of the time. Now, what gives me so much confidence within that overall statement is what we saw from Brees Hall last season. From weeks 5 through 18, when the coaching staff pretty much let him loose and let him you know, continue to get himself a high volume of overall touches and be the lead back of this offense, he was averaging 20.15 touches per game and 17.29 fantasy points per game throughout the last 13 games of the season. Throughout that span of time was the number two running back in fantasy football in terms of total points in a half PPR scoring format. And he was able to accomplish all of this without Aaron Rodgers and with a bottom five offensive line based on all the injuries that, that offensive line uh, accrued over the course of the 2023 season. Now, this offseason, they've addressed all of that. They brought in offensive linemen galore, Tyron Smith, Morgan Moses, uh, John Simpson, They've also gone ahead and used first-round draft capital to bring in an offensive tackle. Additionally, they're getting back a healthy Aaron Rodgers, and an Aaron Rodgers that has even more weapons this season than he did last. When you have Aaron Rodgers in this offense, it is absolutely going to elevate their potential for touchdowns. Last season, the New York Jets were last amongst all teams in terms of total offensive touchdowns scored. So when we increase the potential for touchdowns, who do you think is going to be scoring a vast majority of those? The expectation is that Brees Hall should be scoring far more touchdowns, should continue to get himself a high volume of overall touches per game, and is certainly a three down back that has hyper upside within the receiving game, which we have seen, of course, Aaron Rodgers help Aaron Jones elevate to those levels in seasons past. Our number three to close out the S tier is B. John Robinson. And I do have a lot of confidence in B. John Robinson, but he is clear in a way the number three amongst the backs that I've already mentioned. Now, going into this upcoming season, we have heard Zach Robinson of the Atlanta Falcons, the new offensive coordinator of the organization, specifically said that he wants to utilize B. John Robinson as the Christian McCaffrey of the Atlanta Falcons offense. So if they're going to utilize him like the quote unquote Christian McCaffrey, and like I mentioned just moments ago, Christian McCaffrey over the course of the last two years, averaging 21 plus touches per game, the volume of opportunity certainly can be there for Bijan Robinson. Now, when we think about the potential of Zach Robinson as this offensive coordinator, yes, he has been the passing game coordinator of the Los Angeles Rams for the last couple seasons, but he has watched Sean McVay, specifically last season, give Kyron Williams a boatload of touches on a consistent basis. So if we're going to continue to see that McVay influence join the Atlanta Falcons offense, we are anticipating a lot of touches for an incredible talent like Bijan Robinson who can get it done on the ground and through the air. Specifically last season in games in which he was given 15 or more touches, he was averaging 16.0 fantasy points per game and a half PPR scoring format. You not only get an upgrade in terms of offensive coordinator and in terms of the overall play calling scheme, you get a huge upgrade at the quarterback position. Kirk Cousins is going to elevate this offense. And like the way that Aaron Rodgers is elevating the Jets offense, Kirk Cousins should be leading the Atlanta Falcons offense to scoring far more touchdowns. And the vast majority of those will be going in the direction of Bijan Robinson. 
Now, before we continue to begin the A tier with Jonathan Taylor, I want to remind you guys, for those of you guys who are looking for additional content, specifically my 2024 fantasy football draft guide prior to your upcoming drafts, be sure to go down to the description and either check out Patreon or Underdog Fantasy. At this current moment in time, if you head on over to Underdog Fantasy and use code Andrew to make a first time deposit minimum of $10, not only are you going to be able to get the 2024 fantasy football draft guide, my rankings that are included with it, those rankings by position, by tier, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, kicker, defense, flex, half PPR, full PPR, all encompassing rankings. Those will be updated over the course of the month of August. So regardless of when you're drafting, you'll be prepared to have an advantage upon your league mates, but you'll also get rankings every single Sunday morning for the remainder of the season in order to help you capture a 2024 fantasy football championship. So for those of you who are interested in taking advantage of the opportunity, and of course, giving yourself a better opportunity of winning this upcoming season, check out the map to the right side of the screen, determine your eligibility, and of course, sign up today using code Andrew. Thank you very much. And again, if you've already done so in the past, you can also check out the Patreon, all this content and much more is available there down in the description thank you very much okay let's get into the a tier beginning with jonathan taylor jonathan taylor last season when fully healthy as a member of this offense was unstoppable 21.38 touches per game and 16.75 fantasy points per game throughout weeks 7 through 18 once he has returned from his you know initial start of the season which he didn't want to play because he didn't have a contract. They obviously had to ramp him up in weeks five and six, but from week seven and beyond, of course, a top tier running back at the position. Now, when you go ahead and talk about the potential of his overall success in 2024, and you know that he's associated with Shane Steichen, the current head coach and offensive play caller for the Indianapolis Colts last season, in terms of running back opportunity, the Indianapolis Colts were number six amongst all teams in the National Football League. We know that there's going to be a lot of opportunity for Jonathan Taylor to succeed. I mean, this is a running back that was a former number one overall back just a couple years ago. And yes, he's been dealing with injuries over the course of the last couple years. But in a full healthy capacity, Jonathan Taylor is absolutely a top five back and one that can very easily... And to no one's surprise, finishes the number one overall back within a given season. He's one of only two running backs since 2018 who's been able to accumulate over 2,000 total yards and 20 total touchdowns within a single season. The only other running back who's been able to accomplish that is Christian McCaffrey. That's the kind of level of success that we're potentially anticipating to see in 2024. I understand many of us are worried about the red zone rushing opportunities that Anthony Richardson will get, but I think that this offense is going to be far more elevated than it was last season, obviously because they had Gardner Minshew last year. The, the offense will be so far ahead of what they were able to accomplish last year that there will be enough touchdowns to go around to still allow Jonathan Taylor to be a top five back. Number five, we have Saquon Barkley, who is going to be in a very similar situation. He is behind an elite offensive line, just like Jonathan Taylor, and he's going to be standing next to a mobile quarterback that could very easily sap his potential fantasy success within the red zone. But let's go ahead and begin by talking about this offensive line. When we go from you know playing for the New York Giants for his entire career, playing behind one of the worst offensive lines, the most dysfunctional offensive lines in 2023, and still being able to post a top 12 fantasy year at the running back position, now you join an offense that has a top offensive line in terms of top five in terms of run blocking grades, top five in terms of DVOA, top five in terms of yards before contact per attempt. These numbers are the biggest difference maker. I mean, last season, Saquon Barkley, in games in which he was given at least one yard, or more in terms of yards before contact, he was averaging 6.6 .6 yards per attempt. The overall upside of Saquon Barkley really hasn't been met because of the lack of talent that has been around him within the New York Giants organization. And now that you join an organization with elite level talent across the board within this offense, I'm anticipating a lot of success. Over the course of the last two seasons, the starting running back of the Philadelphia Eagles offense has gotten themselves Miles Sanders in 2022, 16.42 touches per game. DeAndre Swift in 2023, 17.73 touches per game. Over the course of the last two years, Saquon Barkley within the Giants offense, in games in which he has been given 16 or more touches per game, averaging 18.22 fantasy points per game, he's done that in 22 different games. There's a lot of potential here behind an elite offense line within an offense that should be scoring far more. I understand many of you are worried about the potential of Jalen Hurts, but I think the absence of Kelsey is going to diminish the potential upside of that brotherly shove that really did help Jalen Hurts scored, what, 11 rushing touchdowns from the one-yard line? I think a lot of those touchdowns will be going in the direction of Saquon Barkley this season. Number six, we have Jameer Gibbs. Now, the reason why Jameer Gibbs, of course, has gone down in terms of the overall rankings primarily has to revolve around the idea that he has been dealing with a hamstring injury. But we'll get to that in just a moment because I really do think he is going to be healthy by the time we get to Sunday Night Football against the LA Rams week one. But besides my overall confidence in him being healthy by week one, the fact that he sits behind just similar to you know Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor, he sits behind a top five offensive line in terms of DVOA, 
run blocking grades, yards before content. In fact, I would go ahead and I would crown the Detroit Lions offensive line going into 2024, the number one offensive line in the National Football League. So when you take into account what Jameer Gibbs was able to accomplish with David Montgomery in the lineup from weeks 10 through 21 of last season, 14.17 touches per game, 14.92 fantasy points per game. When we take into account the fact that he is going to take even further steps forward in year two, he is going to have an explosion similar to what Alvin Kamara saw going from year one within the New Orleans Saints offense to year two, where he's getting far more utilization, far more potential touches. That step forward that he is going to make and the opportunities that this offense is going to give him really is going to allow him to be a top five potential back. Now, for those of you who are worried about the contributions of David Montgomery, understand that last season from weeks 10 through 21 in games in which they played together, Jameer Gibbs had more red zone rushing attempts and more red zone rushing touchdowns than David Montgomery. It was a 36 to 35 split in terms of total attempts and a 10 versus eight split in terms of total rushing touchdowns. Both of them are going to you know, have themselves a lot of opportunity for upside within this offense. And even though I do anticipate Jameer Gibbs taking even further steps forward and potentially sapping more touchdowns from David Montgomery within the, a lot of these scenarios, the fact that he was so inefficient within the receiving game last year and the fact that they wanted to focus on that this offseason leads me to believe that he'll be even more impactful for fantasy purposes. Our number seven and the final player within the A tier is Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams last season was number two amongst all running backs in terms of fantasy points per game on average, averaging 19.92 while averaging 21.67 touches per game within the 12 games that he played healthy last year. Despite the fact that he only played 12 games, he was number three amongst all running backs in total rushing yards accumulated. Now, one of the biggest lessons that we learned in 2023 was to not value running backs that were drafted within the second or third round. There were primarily drafted as backups to come in and take over the job. Many of us were scared of the scenarios of Zach Charbonnet with Kenneth Walker in 2023, Tank Bigsby with Travis Etienne. And of course, we witnessed that those running backs weren't able to overtake the primary number one, considering how much talent the primary number one had. And that's exactly the case that we have here going into 2024 with Blake Quorum, of course, being drafted and brought into this organization. I do see Blake Quorum as someone that is going to get attempts. And honestly, it'll take a little bit of the workload off of Kyron Williams to keep him healthy for the entirety of this upcoming season. The reality is they're going to continue to utilize him as their workhorse running back. Sean McVay has a great record with workhorse running backs, especially someone like Todd Gurley. And even though that may feel like a long time ago, what we do know from recent experience is that Sean McVay doesn't have a great track record in terms of usage with rookie running backs. So going into this upcoming year, it is going to be all Kyron Williams within a high-powered offense for the Los Angeles Rams. To begin the B tier, we have Devon Chain. I really did believe that there was a possibility that I could insert him within the A tier, but I really do feel confident with Taylor, Barkley, Gibbs, and Kyron Williams as guys that I'm investing in in the late first, early second. And as we get into the you know later picks of the second round, potentially in the mid to late second, Devon Achan should be coming off the board and should be the eighth running back selected, primarily because of what he was able to accomplish last year and the potential of getting even more touches in 2024. Last year, he had a 7.77 yard per carry average, 5.07 yards after contact per attempt average, number one at both overall statistics amongst all running backs. In fact, if you look at the history of the National Football League, Devon Achan, in terms of his yard per carry average last season, was second only behind BD Feathers all time in the National Football League for single season yard per carry attempt average. And BD Feathers played in 1934. Just putting into perspective the history breaking success that Von HN had. I mean, of course, he was breaking history last year. He put up a game of 49 fantasy points against the Denver Broncos. Now, last season, in games in which he played, and when he got himself a pretty good volume of touches, specifically 11 or more touches in any given game. Those eight games that he played, he was averaging 21.4 fantasy points per game. Even with Raheem Mostert in the lineup, was still able to find himself a high volume of success. And Raheem Mostert, yes, he scored 21 touchdowns last season, but I don't anticipate that to continue going into this year. I expect a far bigger role within this offense and within this backfield for Devon A. Chan. And with so much potential for being a top five back, if in fact those touchdowns continue to stack up for him going into this year, I mean, we we know he's a three down back we know he's going to get himself the vast majority of the receiving utilization out of this backfield and yes there is going to be contributions from raheem moster similar to the way that you know jameer gibbs will be fending off david montgomery but either way devon hn far too talented to ignore number nine we have travis Etienne, who has fluctuated greatly within my overall rankings but when we talk about unimpeded volume of opportunity and i'm going to mention this on multiple occasions today i mean travis Etienne has demonstrated that over the 2023 season and going into 2024, we anticipate to see the same. Now, what I define as unimpeded volume of opportunity is an offense that isn't within the top 10 rushing attack in the National Football League 
and isn't giving their running backs top 10 overall potential touches. But yet, despite all of that, the efficiency and the specific concentrated volume of touches going in the direction of one running back allows them to be valuable for fantasy purposes. Specifically last year, Travis Etienne handled 75% of the running back attempts and 80% of the running back targets within the Jaguars offense. That's volume of opportunity that again, cannot be ignored going into 2024. We know that he is a capable three down back and honestly has a lot of potential to improve his overall efficiencies. I mean, last year he had 325 total opportunities. That's a combination of rushing attempts and targets within this offense. Last year, averaging 14.91 fantasy points per game with an expanded role this off season as a receiver. We know that his relationship with Trevor Lawrence going back to the days at Clemson, He's going to continue to be targeted at a high rate. And of course, if he's going to continue to get himself anywhere between 250 to 275 rushing attempts within a given season, he's going to be highly valuable for fantasy purposes. Number 10, we have Derrick Henry, who has, over the course of his career, consistently been an RB1. In fact, he has been a top eight fantasy running back in the last five seasons. And the six consecutive seasons should be within a Ravens uniform. Last season, the Baltimore Ravens running backs were number five amongst all in terms of total fantasy points scored. I mean, just taking this into perspective, last season, Gus Edwards had 13 rushing touchdowns, 12 of which came with inside the five yard line last season. There is so much potential for Derrick Henry to be a double digit touchdown scorer. And if in fact, this offensive line can be just a little bit better than what the Tennessee Titans had last season, the expectation is that Derrick Henry should be the full focus of the running game. Yes, there'll be a little bit of utilization for Justice Hill, but the vast majority of overall touches should be going in the direction of Derrick Henry, even receiving utilization. So when you join an offense that has a run first approach, a mobile quarterback, that backside defense event cannot come down the line of scrimmage in order to meet Derrick Henry because he has to respect the fact that Lamar Jackson can keep the ball and the fact that this is an offense that at the running back position has a top five strength of schedule. I understand that many of you are afraid of the age of Derrick Henry, but he's a superhuman. Number 11, we have Isaiah Pacheco, the thumbnail of today's episode. Listen, Isaiah Pacheco has really grown on me this offseason, especially as of late. In the absence of Jarek McKinnon, he is going to have unimpeded volume of opportunity. I mean, even though last season he was still able to get himself 81% of the running back rushing attempts within this offense, only 53% of the running back targets, but that number is going to grow. Last season from weeks 12 through 22, without Jarek McKinnon in the lineup, we saw Isaiah Pacheco averaging four targets per game, 3.88 receptions per game, 17.75 receiving yards per game, and 0.13 receiving touchdowns per game. A 17-game pace is 68 targets, 66 receptions, and 302 receiving yards. The potential of Isaiah Pacheco being a three-down back and being able to handle 20-plus touches per game is just on the horizon. We're talking about in games last season without Jarek McKinnon. He was averaging 21.88 touches per game and 17.14 fantasy points per game. There is a high likelihood that he's able to outproduce the number 11 rank that I currently have him at. The only issue that I've ever had is the fact that, unfortunately, Andy Reid does not like to run the ball a lot in the red zone. And hopefully, with the offensive improvements, we'll get more touchdowns in the direction of Isaiah Pacheco. But it's purely just a matter of play calling and kind of philosophy of Andy Reid not wanting to utilize the running back at a high volume in comparison to a lot of the other teams. But nonetheless... A lot of value going in the direction of Pacheco. To close out the RB1 conversation, we have Josh Jacobs. Again, Josh Jacobs, in terms of what he has done for the Las Vegas Raiders, he has always been an RB1 in his healthy seasons. Now, this can be broken down throughout different spectrums of time. I mean, we can talk about last season, prior to his injury, was a top 11 overall running back. We go back to 2022 when he didn't miss any games. Of course, was the number three overall back in terms of you know total fantasy points scored. The year prior to that, after he came back from his turf toe injury from weeks four through 18, was a top 12 running back for fantasy purposes. But if we talk about fantasy point per game averages, over the course of the last five seasons as the lead back of the Las Vegas Raiders, he has been number 18, 4, 18, 13, and 14 in terms of fantasy point per game average. So the number 12 rank, honestly, it's just. But now that you join a new offense, an offense that has supported an RB1 over the course of the vast majority of the last five seasons in Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones in the last five years has been the number two, five, 12, and nine overall running back. We have a lot of potential for Josh Jacobs to continue his success. And even though, yes, he is getting up there in age, he is still a ripe 26. And that's the perfect age for another RB1 season to join his overall resume. He is a three down back that is capable of getting himself a lot of utilization within the receiving game in 2021 and 2022 as a member of the Las Vegas Raiders offense with Derek Carr there. Josh Jacobs was able to accumulate himself 64 targets and 53 receptions minimum throughout those two overall seasons. I'm anticipating a three down reign within the Green Bay Packers offense, which is far better than what he was able to experience last year within the Raiders. 
Moving off to the C tier, we begin with Rashad White, which I don't understand why Rashad White is being drafted in like what the fifth or sixth round it is unbelievable the volume of opportunity that he was given last season 336 touches should never be dropping to that round but hey if we can take the discount let's do it last season in terms of unimpeded volume of opportunity 75 percent of the running back rushing attempts and 74 percent of the running back targets within this offense from week 7 through 18 when they really gave him the full workload of this offense and they allowed him to be far more utilized within the receiving game he was averaging 15.91 fantasy points per game throughout that span of time. We have heard all offseason the head coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, Todd Bowles, come out and say there are very few running backs like Rashad White. And he has been hyper positive revolving the idea of keeping Rashad White as a three down back within this overall offense. He proved that he could handle it last year and going into this upcoming year with the potential of 300 plus touches. I mean, where can we go wrong in this selection? of Rashad White, especially with all the PPR upside. I honestly compare him to being the younger version as of right now in terms of comps to Alvin Kamara. Now, speaking of Alvin Kamara, he's our number 14. Alvin Kamara going into this year, yes, he is an older running back. I think he's going into his year 29 season. He's definitely getting up there in age, but he still has a lot left in the tank. Last season, from weeks 4 through 16, after his suspension, he was averaging 15.8 fantasy points per game and was the number two overall back in terms of fantasy points total throughout that span of time. I mean, like I mentioned just moments ago, he, he and Rashad White in terms of comparisons based on the receiving utilization are very similar. The difference just being that Alvin Kamara is older and that's kind of why I've moved him down in comparison to where I've had him this earlier this offseason as a top 12 back and obviously has been dealing with a little bit of a back injury in training camp. He'll be healthy and I don't have an issue with that. He is at a higher risk for some injuries, but ultimately anybody can get injured at any given time that's the nature of the sport of football so going into this year as the lead back of an offense that is going to continue to utilize him at a high capacity again he was getting himself 20 plus touches per game last season throughout you know weeks four through 16 on average and considering he's getting himself a high volume of receptions those opportunities are going to be extremely valuable he was on pace last season for 119 targets, 103 receptions, and 655 receiving yards if he had played a full 17-game season, considering how much he was targeted out of the backfield by Derek Carr. Now you get a new offensive coordinator in the form of Clint Kubiak, who of course is a former offensive coordinator of the Vikings in 2021 and a former passing game coordinator of the 49ers in 2023. He should be utilizing Kamara like the former Dalvin Cook and of course Christian McCaffrey of the offenses that of course he was associated with as a coordinator. Moving on to our number 15 to close out the C tier, we have James Cook. James Cook is the last running back that I'd feel comfortable having as my RB1 going into 2024. So if you begin with a heavy wide receiver approach and you're on the clock and James Cook is the best of, you know, available running back, I'd suggest you take him. Specifically because of what he was capable of accomplishing from weeks 11 through 20 of last year with Joe Brady as the offensive coordinator. 20.1 touches per game, 13.96 fantasy points per game. He is clearing away the workhorse RB1 of this team, a three down back, and even with... Stefan Dix and Gabriel Davis out of the lineup. I mean, shoot, even with them in the lineup late last season, they were not really effective. This is a run first attack. And the biggest issue with James Cook's overall upside, despite the fact that he is going to get himself 18 to 20 touches per game on average, the biggest issue is Josh Allen. Josh Allen scored 15 rushing touchdowns last year, a vast majority of them within the red zone. So if that is going to continue to, you know, limit the overall upside of James Cook, then sure, that's why he sits at number 15. But Really, going into this upcoming year, he has the potential of getting more touchdowns, getting more receiving work, and that leading to his overall success. I think that we won't see Josh Allen score 15 rushing touchdowns again. A couple of those will be going in the direction of James Cook, which will make him valuable, but he's not going to be a double-digit touchdown scorer. Even though we want that to be the case, I don't think that'll be the case in 2024. Moving on to our number 16, we have Kenneth Walker III. Kenneth Walker is clearly a three-down back, and that's exactly how the new offensive coordinator of the Seattle Seahawks Ryan Grubb pretty much sees him. That's what he has mentioned all offseason, that they're going to utilize him at a high capacity. And that's what he was last season prior to injury. Throughout the 14 healthy games he played last year with Zach Charbonnet in the lineup, Kenneth Walker was getting himself 77% of the running back rushing attempts and 52% of the running back targets. So if we go ahead and continue to allow him to be the three down back of this team, yes, there are going to be a couple sprinkles of Zach Charbonnet over the course of a game, you know, on third down in two minute, you know, potential situations. That's not an issue. We know that Kenneth Walker is by far and away the clear number one back. He's going to be handling the early down work and he's going to be the goal line recipient of a lot of those opportunities. So if we take into account the last couple seasons of success, specifically the last 26 healthy games he has played, he's averaging 18.85 touches per game and 14.27 fantasy points per game. I mean, shoot, last season prior to his injury from weeks one through 10 was the number 10 overall running back in terms of fantasy points per game on average. 
Number 17 is Joe Mixon. I really do think that Joe Mixon could very easily crush the number 17 standing, considering what he's been able to accomplish the last three seasons, a top 12 running back for the Cincinnati Bengals in each of those three years, coming off of a year in which he averaged 14.18 fantasy points per game. But when you join the Houston Texans offense, and there are so many mouths to feed with Diggs, Collins, Dell, and Schultz, there is potential in which Joe Mixon may not be able to benefit from a high volume of receptions and or touchdowns. But that even being said, we know that this offense wants to run the ball a lot. So he will get a vast majority of the overall touches in a Bobby Slowick-led offense, the new offensive coordinator, of course, who just joined the Houston Texans in 2023. Throughout those you know, overall weeks, we saw a little bit of sprinkles of Damian Pierce and Devin Singletary. Eventually, it became the Devin Singletary show. From weeks 10 through 18, Devin Singletary averaging 19.44 touches per game and 13.17 fantasy points per game. We know that Joe Mixon is a far more talented back than Devin Singletary. The expectation is that if they're going to give him a similar volume of touches, he should be able to crush the number 17 standing, but nonetheless, still a valuable back going into 2024 that I'd be happy to have as my RB2. Number 18 is David Montgomery. Of course, with all of the injury information and worry regarding Jameer Gibbs, again, I'm not too worried about the overall situation. I'm not increasing David Montgomery within my overall rankings. He pretty much still you know, stands as the number 18 based on the volume of production he had last season. I mean, behind an elite offensive line, top five in DVOA, run blocking grades, yards before contact per attempt, all of those important statistics. I mean, he was able to find himself a lot of success, even in games in which he was splitting touches with Jameer Gibbs between weeks 10 through 21, averaging 15 touches per game and 12.91 fantasy points per game while only playing 44% of the offensive snaps. It didn't matter. And even though the red zone rushing attempts were split 50-50 down the middle, I, you know, Jameer Gibbs did have himself one extra attempt, but even in red zone rushing touchdowns from weeks 10 through 21, Jameer Gibbs had 10 and David Montgomery had eight. If in fact going into 2024, they're going to take it easy with Jameer Gibbs to begin the season, keep it slow, and make it a heavy David Montgomery offense to begin the year. Honestly, he's going to continue to sustain his value within this offense and continue to be the most valuable handcuff in fantasy football in 2024. Number 19, we have Najee Harris, who in my opinion doesn't get enough credit based on the production that he has had. He's definitely been a more polarizing figure in terms of overall running backs and I have him at number 19 primarily because we have heard recent information regarding Jalen Warren being injured and potentially missing a couple weeks this upcoming season but besides that he has been given ample opportunity and he has been able to deliver for fantasy purposes over the course of the last two seasons regardless of whether Jalen Warren was in or out of the lineup in 2022 from weeks 6 through 18 averaged 13.41 fantasy points per game throughout that span of time was the number nine overall back number 12 in terms of fantasy points per game on average last season from week 7 through 18 after the bye week 12.51 fantasy points per game number eight overall back number 18 in terms of fantasy points per game while also splitting touches with Jalen Warren the thing about Najee Harris is that he has never missed a game due to injury he gets a quarterback upgrade in the form of Russell Wilson and or Justin Fields this season and you get a new offensive coordinator that is far better than what Matt Canada was presenting to this offense last year Arthur Smith the new offensive coordinator led the Atlanta Falcons to being number one amongst all teams in running back rushing attempts that'll continue this year and of course a vast majority of those going in the direction of Najee Harris to begin the E tier we have James Conner I love James Conner. Honestly, I would have loved to have put him within the D tier. The only issue is health. James Conner has never played a full healthy season. And that is what kind of concerns me going into 2024 because the expectation is that he should miss anywhere between three to four games. And if that's going to be the case, then bringing in Trey Benson, a third round pick in the 2024 NFL draft, many of us see him as a handcuff. He could be a threat to take the job. In my mind, even if James Conner is to miss time, Trey Benson probably ends up splitting touches with Amari Di Mercado. And once, in fact, James Conner returns, he will be the clear and away RB1. He is the more talented back in this backfield. And what he was able to demonstrate last season within this offense leads me to believe that he'll continue to be a top 20 back because over the course of the last three seasons, as the lead back of the Arizona Cardinals, he has never ranked below a top 20 position in terms of end of season rankings and additionally has always been top 10 in terms of fantasy points per game in each of the last three seasons as a running back. I mean, last season in healthy games, 19.08 touches per game, 15.28 fantasy points per game. It's not like, you know, his age is getting up there and where his body's completely falling apart and he's not able to be efficient with his overall touch of someone like Ezekiel Elliott. It's not that overall situation. We still have an efficient back and one that is continuing to find success and therefore going into 2024, we're going to treat him as such as our number 20 overall. Number 21, speaking of older running backs, we have Aaron Jones, who again, 
Unfortunately, in 2023, coming off of an unfortunate year because of the hamstring injuries that definitely did slow him down and didn't allow him to get a you know consistent string of games in which he was able to find success. But at the end of the year, the final five games of his tenure with the Green Bay Packers offense, 22.6 touches per game, 18.16 fantasy points per game. He's still got a lot left in the tank. And from 2019 to 2022, he had been a top 12 running back in each of those seasons, averaging 15.29 fantasy points per game throughout the 62 games he played throughout those four years. So I anticipate to continue to see Aaron Jones succeed this upcoming season. But like we have seen in the last couple of years with the Green Bay Packers offense, Aaron Jones was splitting touches with A.J. Dillon. Going into this offense with the Minnesota Vikings, we do anticipate to see some utilization out of Ty Chandler. Even though Aaron Jones will be the lead back, someone that is going to get himself goal line work, receiving utilization, all of that, I still think that this offense, with Sam Donald as the lead quarterback in comparison to if they had Kirk Cousins, I mean, if they had Kirk Cousins, I would value Aaron Jones far higher because I would expect a far more higher likelihood of touchdowns to be associated with it in his overall potential over the course of a 17-game season. But going into this year, again, with Ty Chandler potentially biting at his heels, and the fact that the quarterback play may not be at the highest level, which may not lead to as many touchdowns as we'd like associated with this overall end of season scoreline. I do anticipate still a lot of touches going in the direction of Aaron Jones, considering most recently he has shown he can handle those touches and still be efficient. Number 22, we have Ramondre Stevenson. Last season, within the most dysfunctional you know, potential offense in 2023, and definitely the most dysfunctional New England Patriots offense over the course of the last 20 years, Ramondre Stevenson from weeks 1 through 12 was still averaging 11.3 fantasy points per game and was the number 23 overall back throughout that span of time. Going into this year with a new offensive coordinator, new head coach, of course they brought in the specific offensive coordinator who was formerly the OC of the Cleveland Browns, a run first offense. And we have heard Gerard Mayo, new head coach of this team, said that they want to run the ball first, and that is going to be their primary emphasis as an offense. Considering you have Drake May and Jacoby Brissett, I don't blame you that that is your primary emphasis. But going into this upcoming season, Ramondre Stevenson is still in a dysfunctional offense, and it probably will not get any better uh, for a while. And with that being the case, he's still going to have fantasy value because he is a three down back and he's efficient in doing so. He's going to be able to get himself a lot of third down work and a lot of receiving utilization. Again, going back to 2022, got himself a lot of utilization in that in that category, which led him to being the number 11 overall back within that season. Even though I don't expect him to reach that potential this season, considering the pieces around him, I still expect a high volume of opportunity and production for fantasy purposes. 23, we have DeAndre Swift, who is joining his third team in three years and regardless of that fact has been a top 24 running back in each of the last three seasons now he joins an offense that he is going to be the de facto number one in the chicago bears who has a top 10 offensive line in terms of run blocking grades and dvoa and pretty you know pretty good in terms of top 15 in terms of yards before contact per attempt last season and that was with a different offensive coordinator and that was with different running backs you bring in deandre swift who is far better than guys like khalil herbert and roshan johnson and i have no concern about them potentially digging into his work because deandre swift is clearly a three down back. And when you have a new offensive coordinator like Shane Waldron jumping into the conversation, he was able to help elevate Kenneth Walker to being a top 20 running back in each of the last two seasons within the Seattle Seahawks offense. My anticipation with the improvements that this offense has made, bringing in Caleb Williams, continuing to invest in their offensive line, bringing in guys like Keenan Allen, there is so much firepower within this offense and DeAndre Swift is kind of being forgotten about. He is certainly going to be in far lighter overall boxes with definitely less than eight defenders in that scenario should lead to far more open lanes for him to find success in 2024. Speaking of 24, let's talk about Raheem Mostert as again, in my opinion, the second most valuable handcuff going into this upcoming season could even be considered the most valuable handcuff in fantasy football. Depends on how you want to go ahead and evaluate him versus David Montgomery. But I mean, Raheem Mostert last season was able to be the number two overall running back in fantasy football. Obviously, the catalyst being 21 total touchdowns scored. But understand that, you know, even if he doesn't score those touchdowns, let's say he cuts, you know, those touchdowns in half. He is still going to be a highly valuable fantasy running back based on his efficiency. Last season, 4.84 yards per carry, 3.4 yards after contact per attempt. The Dolphins offense last season were top five in terms of total running back opportunities. And when we talk about the potential of having two running backs within the top 24 of the overall running back rankings within a given year, you need to have an offense that is giving their running backs top 10 in terms of overall opportunity. Since 2018, we have a 100% success rate within that overall scenario. And of course, the Miami Dolphins should continue that trend this upcoming season. I'm anticipating that Raheem Mostert will have a lesser role within this offense, but even then, he is still going to get the first crack at early down work. He's still going to get himself a lot of red zone utilization, 
and he's still going to be a top 24 valued running back. And honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if he even ranked higher this upcoming season. Number 25 to begin the F tier. Even though it is quote unquote the F tier, Zamir White has a lot of value going into this upcoming season based on what he was able to demonstrate last year and what the Raiders offense has been able to create over the course of the last plus five years. I mean, we talked about Josh Jacobs earlier, always being an RB1 when healthy. And Josh Jacobs over the course of 2019 to 2023 has always been top 18 in terms of fantasy points per game at the running back position. So when we have Zamir White last season from weeks 15 through 18, putting up 23.25 touches per game, 14.05 fantasy points per game throughout those four games, getting himself good receiving utilization, averaging 2.25 receptions per game. When we have all of that taken into consideration with the fact that this offense and the specific head coach, Antonio Pierce, has said, we want to give our primary number one running back 20 touches per game. With that overall sentiment and the fact that they have no running back competition I mean, they brought in Alexander Madison. He is not a threat. I mean, he lost his job last year to Ty Chandler. The anticipation is that Zamir White should be clear and away a running back that is going to get himself 250 plus rushing attempts. The utilization he gets within the receiving game is obviously going to be the determining factor for his over upside, but the touches are going to be there. This will be a far better offense now that they have Gardner Minshew as the starting quarterback and Zamir White as the number 25 honestly is a great investment, especially if he's able to find himself a lot of success within the red zone. Number 26. Tony Pollard. Speaking of a running back that has found a lot of success within the red zone recently, I mean, he's been a top 15 fantasy back in the last two seasons as an associated member of a top five NFL offense with the Dallas Cowboys. Now that he joins the Tennessee Titans, they're going to be far less than the top five offense in terms of overall touchdown scored, which obviously does diminish the value of Tony Pollard on top of the fact that he is going to be splitting touches with Ty J Spears. But Tony Pollard has been a top, you know, 10 running back in fantasy, even with splitting touches with Ezekiel Elliott in the past in 2022, the biggest difference maker being touchdowns. Even though Tony Pollard is a capable three down back, Tyze Spears is as well. And even with Brian Callahan coming into this offense, he is the new head coach, primary play caller. The former OC of the Bengals helped Mixon lead to being a top 12 running back in each of the last three seasons. We can look to potentially the usage of what we saw Chase Brown Mixon last year and maybe hope that Tony Pollard can be the Mixon and Ty J Spears could be the Chase Brown. So potentially something of the extent of where Tony Pollard's getting himself 15 touches per game. Chase Brown's getting himself 10 touches per game. But Tony Pollard being the clear and away number one. That's what I'm anticipating to see. And with those overall volume of opportunities, whether it's on the ground or through the air, he should be able to find himself a lot of success. And number 26 should be his baseline floor. Number 27, we have Brian Robinson Jr., the lead back of the Washington Commanders offense. Last season, from weeks 1 through 12 prior to his injury, 15.6 touches per game, 13.02 fantasy points per game. In games last season in which he was given 50% of the offensive snaps or more, 15.99 fantasy points per game. You bring in a new offensive coordinator, Cliff Kingsbury, who back in the day with the Arizona Cardinals helped support an RB2 in each of those seasons. I mean, we're talking about Kenyon Drake in 2020 was the number 14 overall back. James Conner in 2021 was the number 5 overall back. The following year, James Conner, even though he got injured, was still a top 20 back in fantasy football. So why not Brian Robinson Jr.? The primary reason many of us are afraid, despite the fact that he has the second best strength of schedule at the running back position, is the fact that Austin Eckler is in the overall conversation. And if Austin Eckler is going to sap a majority of the receiving work, which is very common in a Cliff Kingsbury offense, we talk about guys like Kenyon Drake and James Conner succeeding, all while Chase Edmonds was able to find himself success and be a top 36 ranked back within those two seasons. Eckler's certainly going to be in the top 36 conversation, which does diminish the potential upside of Brian Robinson Jr. But still, 27, again, we're drafting these guys at their base minimum. Number 28, we have Javante Williams, who I think is going to be the clear and away number one of this backfield, but we will st still see a committee. Even though it's not going to be as heavy of a committee as it was last season, I think the primary two-headed monster that we're going to see this year is going to be between Javante Williams and Jaleel McLaughlin. And we have seen Javante Williams produce as a top 17 running back in his rookie year with Melvin Gordon being the back that he split touched with, uh, touches with. So if we're going to see Javante Williams get himself a high volume of touches and be on the field very often, I mean, 28, very similar to a lot of these other guys like Tony Pollard, Brian Robinson Jr., Zamir White that I just mentioned. I think this is a low ranking. It really, when, once in fact injuries do take place and other guys are going to fluctuate in terms of rankings, Javante at 28 is still a great overall investment. Last season, in games in which he played 50% of the snaps or more, 13.52 fantasy points per game. Additionally, this is an offense with Peyton and, of course, Lombardi, their offensive coordinator, who is going to give their running backs between 130 to 150 targets. That level of opportunity is going to be extremely valuable for fantasy, especially in a PPR, behind a top 
10 ranked offensive line. Javante Williams should be a great overall option, especially considering Bo Nix, the rookie quarterback, they want to lean upon the running game. Number 29, we have Devin Singletary. One of these running backs that, again, if he is given ample opportunity, should still be able to find success. Primarily because when I have looked back from 2019 to 2023, there have been 63 running backs that have been able to get themselves 150 rushing attempts and 40 receptions within a single season. 59 of those 63 running backs, pretty much a 94% success rate, were able to score a minimum of 159.8 fantasy points, which over the course of the last five seasons on average, 159.8 fantasy points is RB24 on average. So at worst case scenario, at number 29, Devin Singletary is still able to be a valuable RB3 on your roster. He is joining Brian Dayball again, who he of course played for with the Bills in 2019 to 2021 throughout those three seasons, ranked as RB31, 34, and 20. Devin Singletary filling into pretty big shoes should be the clear and away RB1 of this offense and get himself you know, all of the red zone rushing attempts and hopefully the vast majority of the running back receiving utilization out of this backfield. Our number 30 is Jerome Ford. I've moved up Jerome Ford a pretty big number, primarily because I've mentioned this in the past and I'm going to continue to commit to it. Considering we don't have a lot of information regarding Nick Chubb, it leads me to believe that Nick Chubb is easily going to miss the first four weeks of the season, if not more time. And last season, in the absence of Nick Chubb, from weeks 3 through 18, Jerome Ford was the number 18 overall back, number 22 in terms of fantasy points per game on average. All while he was averaging 11 fantasy points per game, with Kareem Hunt getting himself 10 touches per game out of this backfield. So regardless of the fact that there's going to be a potential of Nick Chubb returning and or Deontay Foreman getting utilization out of this backfield, Jerome Ford is the number one. And considering how brutal that Nick Chubb knee injury was, ACL, MCL, meniscus, very easily could end up missing or at least being limited. I mean, let's say he misses five games. Then he's limited for another four afterward. I mean, the first seven games of the season for the Cleveland Browns is the third easiest strength of schedule. Jerome Ford's going to come out of the gates hot in a run first offense, and he's going to be able to find success. And even once, in fact, Nick Chubb returns, last season, Kareem Hunt coming off of the couch in 15 games was still able to finish as RB39. I think RB30 is a perfect spot for Jerome Ford going into this upcoming season. Number 31, we have Ty J Spears. Like I mentioned earlier, in regards to Tony Pollard and the potential of this backfield, this is going to be a two-headed monster. Tony Pollard should be the 1A, while Ty J Spears should be the 1B. But even as the number two running back of this offense last season, he still you know, managed to be a top 36 ranked running back with 100 rushing attempts and 52 receptions. So if we're anticipating to see even more rushing attempts, a similar number of overall receptions for Ty J Spears, he should be of a better value than he was last season. So the number 31 rank pretty much suits him. I do anticipate to see enough utilization in terms of rushing attempts to keep him efficient on a weekly basis he's not going to have to score a touchdown and the receiving work especially if you play in a half or full ppr will be enough to continue to allow him to be eight rb3 i mean last season from weeks 13 through 18 he was averaging 12.16 touches per game 10.67 fantasy points per game if he's able to get similar numbers in terms of touches and fantasy points per game he should be the jalen warren of this upcoming season number 32 we have Austin Eckler, who should also be very similar to Jalen Warren and Ty J. Spears in terms of overall usage, primarily because he is joining an offense with Cliff Kingsbury, the new offensive coordinator, that is going to pretty much turn him into the Chase Edmonds of this offense. And the reason why I use Chase Edmonds as the example is because in 2020 and 2021, with Cliff Kingsbury, Chase Edmonds was the number 28 and the number 35 overall running back throughout those two seasons as an Arizona Cardinal. The Cardinals from 2020 to 2022 targeted their running backs 100, 103, and 112 times. That ranked 17, 19, and 12 amongst all teams in those given years. This is a former top two running back in 2021 and 2022 for fantasy purposes. He's one of the most decorated receiving running backs in NFL history. He's number two all time in terms of running back receptions within a given year. He is a very talented running back and Specifically, if you ignore the running game usage and just make him a receiving back as a whole, PPR format going to be a really valuable back to potentially have as your flex and in the rotation. And if he scores touchdowns, gets himself more rushing utilization that we anticipate can be even more valuable. Number 33. Speaking of running backs that could be of value that are getting themselves a lot of receiving utilization, Jalen Warren was able to demonstrate that for the entirety of last season. Weeks 1 through 18, averaging 9.76 fantasy points per game. This is going to be a run-first offense. You bring in Arthur Smith that led the Atlanta Falcons to leading number one amongst all teams in terms of running back rushing attempts. Last season, Jalen Warren had three or more receptions in 14 of the 17 games he played, even though he is dealing with a hamstring injury, and that's primarily the reason why I've dropped him within my rankings. He should end up still playing 15-plus you know, overall games this year. 
If he plays less, of course, that's primarily because of the injury going into the season. But even if he misses a little bit of time at the beginning of the year, once he gets fully healthy, he is still going to be a valuable back within this run first offense. Number 34, we have Chase Brown, who, in my opinion, is going to be this lead back eventually for the Cincinnati Bengals. And even though many of us may think that there is potential for Zach Moss to take the job or beat him within this overall conversation, we have heard far too much rumbling from Chase Brown to ignore it. Last season, with Joe Mixon averaging 18 touches per game, we still saw a guy like Chase Brown averaging 8.83 touches per game, 7.28 fantasy points per game. He is very much so a capable third down receiving back. And based on all the receiving utilization that Joe Mixon has seen over the course of the last three years, that has elevated him to being an RB1. My anticipation is that Chase Brown should be pretty much inheriting all that utilization. And if in fact at any time, Zach Moss is inefficient with the rushing attempts, Chase Brown will come in, make huge plays, and eventually take the job. That is the expectation, and that is why I rank him sitting here at number 34. It's going to take a while for him to compete with Zach Moss to clear and away be the RB1, but once in fact it takes place, he will be of value for fantasy. Number 35, we have Jonathan Brooks, who, very similar to Chase Brown, it's going to take a little while to get there, but eventually will be the number one running back of this team. Now, the reason why it's going to take him a little while primarily has to do with the fact that he's coming off of an ACL injury in 2023. But once he returns, Dave Canales, the primary play caller and the head coach of this team, drafted him for a reason. He wants him to be the RB1. Dave Canales has been able to support Kenneth Walker as the number 16 back in Seattle in 2022. And of course, Rashad White last season as the number seven overall running back for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Dave Canales knows how to use his running backs. And once Jonathan Brooks is fully healthy, we should anticipate to see him putting up great numbers for fantasy purposes. Chuba Hubbard will have a head start at the beginning of the season, considering Jonathan Brooks isn't anticipated to play for the first three to four weeks. But once, in fact, they let him loose, just like you know the way that Brees Hall was last season, eventually he'll be the RB1 of this offense and certainly a value. Moving on to the H tier, we have Gus Edwards. Considering all of the variables within this offense, considering Greg Roman is the offensive coordinator of this team, the former OC of the Baltimore Ravens, and his coach Gus Edwards in the past, from 2019 to 2022. Throughout those seasons, the Baltimore Ravens averaging 355 running back rushing attempts per season. As an offense, averaging over 500 rushing attempts per season. The fact that Gus Edwards last season was able to score himself 13 rushing touchdowns within the red zone, sure. He was able to be a dominant force in games in which he had 10 or more touches, averaging 11.76 fantasy points per game, but that was behind an elite offensive line. And going into 2024, we're not 100% certain as to whether or not the Chargers can be an elite offense just like the Bolton Ravens were last year. Sure, the offensive lines can be very comparable in terms of their potential, but if the offense as a whole isn't going to be as implicated for touchdowns as the Bolton Ravens were last year, unfortunately, Gus Edwards' overall value is diminished. We know that J.K. Dobbins is biting at his heels, but... J.K. Dobbins is coming off of an Achilles injury. Speaking of heels, there is a lot that J.K. Dobbins has to do to eventually take over the job from Gus Edwards. He should maintain as the RB1 for the entire season. Number 37, we have Zach Moss. We just talked about the potential of someone like Chase Brown just moments ago. Even though Zach Moss proved that he could be a three down back last season with Indy, there is still a lot of rumblings and a lot of you know practice scenarios in which Zach Moss has been outdone by Chase Brown. And even though you're stepping into a situation that has a lot of running back value, Zach Moss is an investment that you are pretty much making as a lottery ticket player. That's someone that you're hoping is going to stay and maintain as the RB1 or is going to be able to outpace Chase Brown in all of the opportunities. If he's capable of doing so, the number 37 rank should be able to very, very easily be surpassed. But again, there's so much uncertainty within this backfield. I still want a piece of this backfield if I can make the investment. But between the two, as of right now, I'd rather go in the direction of the youth of Chase Brown. Number 38, we have Ezekiel Elliott. From what we have heard all offseason, again, this is going to be a running back by committee situation. And despite all of the success Zeke found last season from weeks 13 through 18 as the lead back of the New England Patriots, 20 touches per game, 13.32 fantasy points per game. Despite the success he saw last time he was with the Dallas Cowboys offense in 2022, weeks 6 through 17, 17.1 touches per game, 15 fantasy points per game. Despite all of that, this is going to be a running back by committee situation. Rico Dowdle. Maybe even there's a little bit of utilization from Royce Freeman. We'll have to wait and see. But I think this is still going to be a top 15 offense within the National Football League. Maybe even top 10. And if they are, touchdowns should be implicated within Ezekiel Elliott's overall role. But still, as a running back by committee, it wouldn't surprise me if you know occasionally other running backs are stealing his value within a given week. Number 39, we have Nick Chubb to close the H tier. This is the thing about Nick Chubb. We just don't have enough information to confidently say when he is going to play. And considering that is the case in comparison to 
a lot of the information we've been given regarding Jonathan Brooks in comparison. Nick Chubb is a little bit less valued. He is pretty much an investment that you are making in hopes that once you get to weeks, I don't know, 10 and beyond, he can be a RB2. But based on the severity of the injury that he sustained last season, we're not anticipating him to be 80% of his normal self. And he doesn't have to be. 80% of his normal self still, you know, pretty much conducts him scoring over 10 fantasy points per game, which within a run first offense wouldn't be a surprise to see. Moving on to our number 40, we have Chuba Hubbard. I mentioned him a little bit earlier in regards to Jonathan Brooks. Chuba Hubbard is going to be the lead back to begin the season until Jonathan Brooks pretty much comes back. But last season as the lead back of this offense from weeks 6 through 18 was the number 18 overall back in terms of total fantasy points scored and number 24 in terms of fantasy points per game on average. Specifically, he was averaging 11.32 fantasy points per game with Miles Sanders handling about seven touches per game last season so eventually we're not going to see miles sanders ha handling seven touches in fact we might see jonathan brooks getting himself the 10 to 14 range after he is fully back and let loose within this offense even though chuba hubbard is a three down capable back he's pretty much only going to have his value for the first one to six weeks and then after that it should be the jonathan brooks show number 41 rico dowdle like i mentioned earlier the Cowboys' backfield is going to be a rotation in 2024. And if that's going to continue to be the case, the expectation is that Rico Dowdle should get himself goal line work, receiving utilization, and honestly could be more valuable than Ezekiel Elliott by the end of the season, primarily because Ezekiel Elliott is getting up there in age and his knees are falling apart. And we have heard from a Cowboys beat writer this offseason that specifically said that he would be surprised if Rico Dowdle didn't lead the Cowboys in rushing yards this upcoming season, which again keeps him in the conversation of a kind of higher end RB4, but could be an RB3 if in fact he overtakes Zeke. Number 42, we have Jaleel McLaughlin, who last season had 107 total touches and 90.5 fantasy points, pretty much 0.85 fantasy points per touch. And in games last season, specifically in which there were four different separate games, in which he had 10 or more touches, was averaging 12.68 fantasy points per game. He is a highly efficient running back. And this is going to be a two-headed monster between, of course, Javante Williams, and Jaleel McLaughlin. I think he's going to get more utilization than Samaj P. Ryan, who of course got himself a lot of utilization last year. But even in the preseason games, specifically this last one, we saw Jaleel McLaughlin get the first crack ahead of Samaj. In an offense that is going to be targeting their running backs 130 to 150 times, I'm anticipating a lot of potential for Jaleel McLaughlin in this scenario. Number 43, we have Ty Chandler. Like we mentioned earlier, Ty Chandler can be a value. With Aaron Jones in the last couple of years splitting touches with A.J. Dillon, we may very easily see a very equal split, like a 65-35 or potentially even a 60-40 split between these running backs. Last season in games in which Ty Chandler had ample touches, specifically at the back end of the year, he had games in which he had 14, 13, 26, 15, 14, 15 touches. In those games, those six games, 11.7 fantasy points per game can certainly be of value. Just got to give him opportunity. Moving on to our 44, J.K. Dobbins. Again, like I mentioned earlier, coming off the Achilles, he's going to have himself an opportunity at 100 to 150 rushing attempts this year. This is an offense that is going to be running the ball a bunch. And they wouldn't have signed him and brought him in unless they knew that he still had some juice in his legs. And honestly, if he doesn't get cut, that means he does still have juice and he could certainly continue to live up to being a co-starter with Gus Edwards. He could very easily split the overall opportunities within this backfield. We have seen J.K. Dobbins, when given ample opportunity, even most recently at the back end of the 2022 season, was averaging 13 fantasy points per game at the back end of the year while averaging 15 touches per game. The opportunity will be there as to how much opportunity there's, there's going to be, considering, of course, Gus Edwards will be the number 1A option of this offense, leads him to being the number 44. Unless J.K. Dobbins gets himself a lot of receiving utilization, again, the number 44 is a solid rank. Number 45, to close out today's video, is Blake Corum. The reason why Blake Corum sits in this situation is because arguably he is the highest valued legitimate handcuff amongst all of the running backs. Now, when I say legitimate handcuff, David Montgomery and Raheem Mostert live outside of being just a handcuff. They have value without an injury taking place. Guys like Tajay Spears, Austin Eckler, Jalen Warren, they technically also upgrade in terms of fantasy upside with an injury to the starter, but they also still find value without an injury. Blake Corum, I don't think, is going to find value outside of a Kyron Williams injury. But in comparison to guys like Mitchell Mason, Sermon, Gainwell, Allen, Algier, Hill, these are all handcuffs to the top-tier running backs for the 49ers, the Colts, the Eagles, the Jets, the Falcons, and the Ravens. In comparison to the rest, Blake Corum is the most talented back. 
And if he joins this offense and at any point is the lead back because of an injury to Kyron Williams, he's easily somewhere between 14 to 16 fantasy points per week on average. And that is why he is drafted where he is. And that's why he sits as my number 45. Okay, guys, thank you everybody for watching. It was a very long video, but that's the entire purpose. Giving you guys all the information that you require prior to your upcoming drafts. Thank you everybody for watching. Subscribe if you haven't yet already. Click the like button down below. I'll be back talking about my top 45 wide receivers next time. And until then, I'll see you guys. Peace.